Hello and welcome to another edition of Composer Talks with White Bear PR. Today we are doing something a little bit different. So instead of having our usual Composer Talk, we are doing a more practical approach and present you a masterclass with the amazing Thomas Meiser and Curtis Moore on the anatomy of writing an original song for the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Winners of the Fred Abb Award for Excellence in Musical Theater Songwriting and a Jonathan Larson Grant from the American Theater Wing, Thomas Meiser and Curtis Moore are an accomplished writing team whose work has appeared on stages and on screens around the world. Most recently, they composed five songs for the Amazon Prime video series, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel for season three, the first original songs ever to be featured on the Emmy winning hit show. And with that, I would like to pass on this masterclass to Tom and Curtis. Hi everyone, I'm Curtis Moore. Uh, super happy to be here with my longtime writing partner and friend, uh, Thomas Miser. And we're here to uh, talk to you a little bit about the songs that we Put together for the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Hi, I'm Thomas Miser, and the same. I'm very excited to be able to share a little bit of our story of how we worked with the team at the marvelous Mrs. Maisel to write the songs. Particularly, we're going to focus on the song uh, "One Less Angel," which was in the first episode of the third season. And it all started really with uh, Amy Sherman Palladino and Dan Palladino reaching out to us and asking us to write a hit song for 1959, which was not daunting in the least. Uh, we got an email from Amy and we actually have that email still. And she just wrote, uh, so I need you boys to write me some songs. Let's start with two. One should be Johnny Mathis meets Sam Cooke type song for Shy Baldwin. Definitely a top 40 crossover hit. And then one should be for a three girl group. I think the girl group should be up tempo and shy, shy song should be a little slower, but still with a beat, not a full ballad. And that's kind of all we had to go on right at the beginning. Yeah, so the, the, first, the first step that we went into uh, when we got the assignment, we didn't really know how much of the song they'd want to use. Uh, and so we want to make sure that when we're writing the song that we're doing it in a way that gives the editors and the, and the team as many options as they have, as, and as many options as we can give them. Uh, Cause we don't know if they edit around it, uh, if they'll use the whole song. In this case, they ended up using the whole song, but we didn't know that at the point when we were writing. So we knew we wanted to start by getting a song that jumped right into the hook as quickly as we could. Um, we wanted to have bite-sized nuggets of little bits of perfect segmented, satisfying hooky experiences. Um, and this was actually, luckily for us, it's true to the era too, uh, in that time, 1959 and 1960, a lot of those songs were crafted really, really tightly, um, and they're just perfect hook machines. Um, and uh, so we did a lot of research beyond those two uh, examples that, that Amy had given us to sort of uh, widen our lens a little bit. And one of our other goals initially was always, and with everything we write, uh, we come from the world of music theater, is to start from story and character. And with this, it's a little different because we don't have a whole musical. We're really just working with a moment in the series and we didn't have scripts yet right at the beginning. But we knew we were going to be introducing Shai's character as his sort of star making moment. Like he was gonna be introduced in that first episode as the biggest, one of the biggest pop stars in the world. And he needed a song that you would sort of believe was a big hit that had that kind of energy. Also, one of the things we thought a lot about was uh, the fact that this is sort of like the meeting of Midge and Shy in a certain way. They'd met in the prior season, but this is sort of the meeting for this new season. So we wanted the song to have kind of the feel of uh, a new romance, optimism, excitement, that that would be a part of it to contrast with where the season goes later and it takes a turn. And then our sort of last thing we wanted to do as a goal was to think about the world of the show. Now, in this case, The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel has a really very specific world. And we had a lot of help from Robin Erdang, who's the music supervisor on the show. She's amazing. She handles all those amazing needle drops in the show. And she gave us a really good sense of, of, of the world of Maisel. Now it's intensely researched as a show. Everything's period perfect, but we sort of honed in on was the fact that it's kind of turned up to an 11. It's perfect, but it has that Maisel sparkle. 
It has that twist of just a little more color. And we wanted to do the same thing with our songs. Like they should be true and feel like the era and full of research, but also have that little bit of nasal sparkle to it. Um, at the same time, we also want to just be true to what nasal is about, which is at its core, it's about strong, empowered women, funny, edgy, and vibrant. And we want to bring that energy to our songwriting as well. Right. And so uh, our first step, we, we got that assignment, um, was to, we just needed to jump, jump in right away. What's different for us, you know, we work a lot in theater. And when we write songs for theater, it's a long process. And we, you know, start and, and may work months and months and months on a whole sequence. In this case, it was happening very, very quickly. So uh, in order to make it as effective as possible, we knew we wanted to give Amy and Dan as many options as we could. So uh, instead of uh, just completing, you know, two or three songs, we decided to write uh, six or seven song lists, little bits of songs. So we started off just to write a verse and a chorus of, of many different songs. And um, the very first uh, discussion we had was uh, the beginning of February, I think, Tom, right? That's when we started. Um, yeah, we got the first email, I think it was like February 7th or 8th of uh, 2019. Right. And, uh, and just to give you a little quick timeline, and then we'll go back through it a little bit. So February, beginning of February to February, we had that first email. Uh, the song was taped and filmed March 26th. So it was barely four and a half weeks from when we were asked to write to when we actually were filming the final song. So it's pretty epic what has to happen in that time. So uh, immediately the first thing we did was uh, Tom and I got together and put together um, uh, our start of what we we're going to do. And Tom gave me a list of hooks. Yeah, normally when we work in music theater, we've got a whole scene, we've got a whole story to work from. Here, we don't have anything yet. Um, the scripts weren't finished, like I said. So we decided to work just from the hook or the, like the title of the song, that little nugget of truth that's music and lyric perfectly combined. And so I went away very quickly and just wrote a list of hooks. Uh, I was thinking a lot about from the era of things that would just sort of have a quality of like a dance floor, because a lot of songs from like 1959 and 1960 talked about like meeting on the dance floor, and the sparkly night on the dance floor. But also they had kind of a mythic quality. There would be lots of cupids and angels and all that stuff. So that was kind of rolling around in my head. And then I had, um, I live in Los Angeles. Curtis lives in New York, which makes writing together kind of like this <laughs> Zoom conversation. We're used to this. Yes, uh, this, is, this is the normal for us going back and forth. <laughs> you are getting a window into exactly how we work. Um, so I was, uh, I was going to see a show at the Amundsen in Los Angeles, and there's a plaza out front where this doo-wop group was out singing before the show. And it was a gorgeous night, and there were stars, and I just was looking around like, ah, oh, the stars shine, and ah, oh, angels, angel, one less angel in heaven. And I, I, I quickly like typed that into my phone, and I sent Curtis an email, which I actually have that email as well. So let me do, this is what I wrote that night to Curtis. This just came to me last night was thinking about super romantic, chill dance oriented songs. It's not quite finished yet. I don't think we can have too many of these ideas, but figure we can run a few different courses by aim to see what she wants. I can sing a bit of the rhythm, rhythm that was in my head, but basically it's the same tempo as Cupid. And uh, could there be stuff as a pickup, I think, T. <laughs> and then I put down a whole uh, list of the, it just had the first rough verse and the hook for the song, One Less Angel. Right, and so, I get that in the mail. I get I get both that set of lyrics uh, and all of the the little hooks. And and you know what's so great about when I get these things from Tom is they've they've already started off. We always talk about what we want to write. We always talk through what the kind of ideas we want to do, and then Tom gets these ideas for a hook or a you know, and that's where we start from. So we just started right from the hook. We had we had that idea, and so the first thing I do is I just sit. I put a recorder on. I sit at my piano and I just sing through the hooks. It's always important for me to just to sing everything if I can. And I actually have the recording of the first time, I think this is the very, this is uh, Valentine's Day last year, me sitting with that lyric for the first time. I just got the email. Literally the first time. Must be one last angel. Rough and terrible. Yours, 
and I'm working on an accompaniment figure. I'm trying to think what the groove is going to be. Um, and so that's the first thing we sort of came up with. Um, and after that, so the, I, you know, I didn't even send that to Tom. That was just for me to sort of get some ideas down. The first thing I sent to Tom was after I set that, I said, the, you know, we, I put together a really, really fast, fast track. Um, and then, um, and then just honed that first lyric that he gave me. And this is what I sent to Tom as our first set. You can hear the vamp I was working on. The night's fine, your eyes catch my eye, and starlight is on, I can see. Could there be one last angel in heaven? Count them one last angel in heaven. Must be one last angel in heaven. Did not, I didn't end the chorus that first time. So I sent that to Tom just, just like, is this, am I on the right target? Are we feeling this? And, and you know, we, again, that starts the process where Tom and I just go back and forth talking about what sounds right, what doesn't sound right, what feels good. You know, when we're writing, it's really important for us to sing and talk the lyrics out and sing the music out. Um, I think it just helps us be authentic. It helps us know what's going to be performed and it's, uh, for me, it's just a way to get out of my fingers and to get on to uh, get into the voice. And so we went back and forth, literally line by line, note by note, uh, lots of little things we changed. And, and there's, you know, as Tom, Tom likes to say, there's a lot of effort goes into making it sound effortless, which is what we wanted to do. So anytime we're listening to this and singing it over and over and over again, over the two days we were doing this, if anything felt not quite right or felt a little bit um, under rehearsed or just didn't feel like it led to the right place, we fixed it, we changed it. So we would change just one note here, an and and a but and a comma, you know, we'd capitalize something. Anyway, we would do, um, you know, we'd make these changes. And so after that, we did a couple more takes and then we submitted um, uh, a couple lyric changes and a couple music changes to Amy. And this is the, this is the segment we submitted first to Amy. Compliment has changed. The lyrics have changed. The stars shine, your eyes catch mine. That your light is all I can see. Could there be one less angel in heaven? Count them one less angel in heaven. Must be one less angel in heaven. Cause you're here smiling at me. And so that's it. That's what we first submitted. And that's the, that's the version that was approved. And it's kind of great to go back and listen to that because it's, it's very close to what we're going to end up doing literally two weeks later. Yeah, it's the amazing thing about the way we work is that we have so many versions that our iTunes libraries are just full of drafts. Like we can't do a shuffle iTunes because I'll get like 16 versions of Curtis singing different little versions of One Less Angel pop up. Uh, What's interesting is that one of the other, the other song that was in that first episode is Bottle of Pop. And that had the opposite direction of how we wrote it. Uh, instead of starting from my lyric, that one actually started with Curtis who had a, an amazing idea for a melody. And he sent it to me just as a melody. And we thought we'd show you that just so you can see the kind of the opposite direction. Because for us, writing is just about whatever gets to it first. We always work together. It's flow, it's back and forth, it's whoever has the best idea at that time. And so I love this because it has probably my favorite Curtis Dummy lyric that I've ever heard in my life working together. So yeah, I just just to give a quick heads up, you know, when I'm doing this without without a lyric from Tom, if I'm having music inspiration, I will just say gibberish and vocal isms and stuff and this was a really interesting one because the groove the hook and the, the backup vocal harmony all came at the same time so this is the very first thing i sent to tom for bottle of pop <laughs> that 
what I'm saying was... at the end of that song is I just said, some really good hook here, which uh, gives Tom some fodder which to go from. And just another side note, a weird thing. I, I can't do a demo unless I'm singing in the range that it's going to be sung in. So I'm always sending Tom me screlting up to the stratosphere with whatever song we're writing, especially yeah. the songs. And there's there's no pressure about getting a demo that says, and a really good hook here. Like, thanks. Thanks, <laughs> Curtis. So I got that. And um, I had been thinking a lot. My parents were actually from Detroit, and they were courting in 59, 60. They got married in uh, 60. Yeah. 64. No, they met in 60. And so we were thinking about this. and. I was just laughing about wanting to include a little bit of my parents in it. And in the Detroit area, in the Midwest, they call uh, soda pop. And so as a little tribute to my parents, I just wanted to write a song about a bottle of pop. And so just like with One Less Angel, we went in and just wrote that first verse for Amy. And this is actually, I think, the what we sent to Amy, adding in the lyric that I wrote to what Curtis had handed me. I'm sitting solo at the soda shop when he comes in and drops onto the seat right by me. I barely know him, but this boy could hop. He goes and buys a pop, and then he says, girl, try me. Ooh, now I've got this fizzy feeling. It's got me so I'm dancing, really. The boy is smiling and he's flipped the top. Who knew your heart could stop? My heart would stop. I love all of that. <laughs> I love well, Curtis good. Moore. Curtis Moore, boy soprano. It's always the best. So yeah, we submitted seven uh, songs to Amy and Dan, uh, just songlets, and then they picked seven. Uh, of, of those seven, they picked four. And two of those, they said they wanted in that first episode of season three, which were One Less Angel and Bottle of Pop. And then two other ones, they said Stick a Pin In, uh, which one of, one of them actually ended up in the season uh, it's just this, the early kernel of no one has to know. And Amy and Dan started giving us some notes. Uh, at that point, they had started, the scripts were coming along, so they knew a little more about what they wanted. But the interesting thing about um, working with them on this is they weren't uh, controlling about what we were writing. They wanted us to sort of go for it and show them things. What they were most concerned about actually were the tempos of the songs and the rhythms and certain hits in it because they're thinking about filming. They're thinking about edits and the pacing of the show, which as you know, is very fast. Everything's faster. Well, every demo that we gave them, they, they said uh, faster. Yeah, absolutely. Everything we did became uh, just about four to 10 BPM faster than our demos, which is great. And it was a really fun kind of, uh, world to watch them which is honestly that's how the whole show is run i mean everybody that whole the whole experience of Maisel, i feel is as tom said earlier it's turned up to 11 so uh that was our our big note and the big the big change that that went from the uh scope of what we did in those demos to what we came into the studio other than the tempo change those the mapping was pretty much exactly as we turned them in once we got that approval we started going into the fine tuning and the big collaboration with the wider team um, we started focusing on writing a bridge uh, and getting it focused for Angel and making small changes throughout. I mean, like we said, like Curtis said, we kept singing and singing these songs to ourselves and doing demo after demo where we'd listen and go like, ah, I want it to lift a little more there. I'll, that word makes me trip up. I keep forgetting to sing that word and that tells me it's wrong because these songs from this era should just feel as if they just rose from the ocean, like Venus, like fully formed. It should just feel effortlessly sort of perfect. And that's what we were trying to create. And one big change that happened lyrically was that we had a different lyric for the last verse. And I had written a lyric that was sort of a, it comes from my music theater background. It had, I had changed the hook of the lyric at the end a couple times just to sort of what I thought create interest and a dynamic of sort of flipping it. But we listened to it and here's the original lyric for the end of the song and then we'll explain what we did. Yes, 
Yeah, so as you can hear there, the, the I guess and no less, I had changed that hook, but when we listened to it across the board, we all went, oh, I want the hook back. It's like making me crazy. I want that hook back. So we decided to put back the hook, the lyrical hook in the first two lines and just save that one twist of my baby said yes, just to give it that like excitement of his discovery is the only time and that part changes. Right. Uh, and so, and those, it's those kind of changes that really, they seem so, it's just funny to hear us talking about them because you're like, what is that really, does anybody really care? It's like this tiny, but it makes such a big difference because even when you watch, what, you know, when we're going to cut, cut ahead now to what happens next, but when you're watching performers perform it, they're picking up on all those little changes and fixes that you're putting in there. Um, you know, so, so the next step that we did after we sort of solidified where we were going with those lyrics uh, was to just finish up the track. We added backup vocals to it. I honed the arrangement a little, a little bit more. We uh, bumped the tempo up a little bit um, and then added some places where uh, Shy Baldwin could riff on top of the melody coming in and out of the chorus. We sent that final uh, demo in. Um, again, this is probably uh, less than a week after we'd gotten the first approval from Amy of the verse and chorus. So we sent in that final demo. That was approved. Um, and I believe that was approved on probably, that was the 23rd of, of February. Um, and then we were just getting prepped to do the, uh, the, the recording session which was gonna happen about five days later. In that time, it was sent off to the amazing Bill Elliott who added uh, some horn charts to it. And um, the band that we were gonna eventually play with in the, in the studio just used uh, a lead sheet and the demos that I sent as their, uh, as their guide. Um, another thing that happened that was kind of uh, fun in that moment, which kind of let us know how fast things were going, about two days after I'd sent Amy that final version, uh, we received a video uh, from her of the entire song already choreographed with the actor who plays Shy Baldwin, uh, Leroy McLean, lip syncing to my demo, which is hilarious to watch him lip syncing to me. And so it just, it was so incredibly fast. And then three days later, we show up to Mena Center in New York, uh, where the session was run by the amazing Stuart Lerman, who produced all of the music for Maisel. He's just an incredible guy, um, uh, where he just gave us the full reign to sort of uh, hone and control and advise and put the whole track together in the studio. We had some of the best players in New York City. That's the advantage of working on a show like Maisel is getting the best players you can. I mean, that's really the key to, to getting a good track of anything. You just want to get as best players as you can get. Um, the track was recorded by an amazing friend of ours uh, named Darius de Haas, who's this fantastic Broadway singer and actor. Um, he came in at his own flourishes. We kind of listened that day, picked the parts we, we liked, worked with the backup vocalists. And after about eight hours in that day, we put together the track. Um, it was a very, very exciting day for us, obviously. and. Uh, and very collaborative and, and really amazing to be in that room with such an amazing group of people. And so um, here is the final version of uh, One Less Angel. I'm going to do a little trick here and play you uh, my final track. And it's going to segue into the final mix we did on that first day of recording. The stars shine, your eyes catch mine, and your light is all I can see. Could there be one less angel in heaven? Come to one less angel in heaven. Must be one less angel in heaven. Cause your hair is smiling at me. Back of vocals are gonna come in here. The strings play, you move my way. I'm soaring now, I guarantee there must be one less angel in heaven. Don't tell one less angel in heaven. Must be one less angel in heaven. Cause look who's dancing with me. Oh, and now I'm scared. I'm scared to close my eyes and open both my I know that I should keep my feelings in disguise, but darling, there is something that I've got to say. My baby, my angel, now please won't you stay? My heart. There's going to be the fixed 
lyrics at the end of the change. The world falls away. Go back to the hook. And the one change. Well, we also did just uh, a little bit in that, I'm just reminded of that when I listened to this, we did a few different vocal changes uh, in this particular recording because we knew it was gonna probably be used again. They play the song twice in, at least twice, I think, right Tom, did they do it one more time? It's, it's at least two times they do uh, this song in the season. And so rather than re-record the whole thing again later in the season, we actually used the same recording but we supplemented it with a string section and a couple of alternate vocal takes, but otherwise it's, it's the same basic track that we recorded that day. So just because we'd finished recording and writing, it wasn't done yet. Uh, that's what we learned as part of the TV process. We were sort of in the whirlwind of it. And right after recording, they said, stay in town, we're gonna send you out to the filming. And they wanted us to be there for that and to sort of assist watch uh, and help with uh, the lip sync of it and the instruments just to have us there in case we needed any help. And it was insanity. Uh, our first day on set was for the big USO show where they're shooting One Less Angel. And there are 800 extras out there all in like their army uniforms. And it was really exciting. And through the day, the guys uh, watching learned the song. And so at one point during the day, we're back at the video village where we're watching monitors. And I forget who it was, someone grabbed her hand and said, come out, come out, come out, come out. And they pulled us out onto set and 800 guys are singing along to our song. And it was, it was such an incredible sort of thrilling moment. And we're not quite sure exactly if, whether that was intentional in the script or not, but they loved it and they turned the cameras around on them. So in the final edit of the song, it goes back after shooting to the music editor, Annette Kudrak. And she does amazing work with these songs. She added a mix to the song, which added in a layer of the soldiers. So you take the song that we had in the recording studio, she actually plays with it, add echoing to it to feel like it's in a big arena. And then she layered in ADR work from some actors doing the soldiers. Uh, and so we have just a little clips you can hear what they actually did to the mix for the series. Yeah, I mean, that definitely adds to the illusion that this song is a big radio hit because everyone's singing along. Certainly that was, a, a, as Tom said, it was a really fun moment because um, we had spent all day listening to the, the song over and over and over again. So by the end of the day, it was a hit for everyone in that room. It was, it was, a, it was a huge sort of uh, moment of relief for us because we knew we loved it, but to see that everyone, like the hook worked, that people got it, that all the planning we, that we went into it, and like Curtis just pointed out, what was one of our goals? Tell story. And that was such a smart choice by the editors and by Amy and Dan to add that the soldier singing along because that helps tell the story and introduce you to the character. You know that he is a hit because everyone knows it. Smart storytelling. Um, another example of Post is that Bottle of Pop, uh, they went in and they discovered that they were gonna use the song at the beginning of the scene, they were gonna start with the women, go backstage, have a long scene, and then come back out and have the girl group finishing the song. And so what they had to do is they actually cut it, lengthen the bridge in post, and they realized they didn't have the right footage of the women's lip sync and dancing that they wanted. So if you watch the show, you can actually tell they're singing the second verse twice. They sing the second verse at the beginning, go away to the bridge, and then come back. And the first time I heard it, I didn't even notice. And I wrote the song, so I was like, that's really amazing that I didn't even notice. It also goes to show you that, uh, that the writing a song in small increments, making sure that we had the 
sort of little bite-sized segments of song that the editors could work with was going to pay off because that way they could move it around. Right. And having those, having that uh, ability to have those little bits of song just ended up being very, as we talked about earlier, really useful when we, uh, when we found out that the song was going to be used later, we could add those strings in, for example, or um, re-edit things around, you know, there's, one of the songs we did uh, in the final uh, episode, uh, we also used lots of different versions of that song. You know, it was originally a, a two-minute song, but in the sequence in the in the show, it ended up being almost four minutes. And that's because we in the studio recorded a whole bunch of additional material in case they needed it, and it turns out they did need it. So it was it was good to keep the songs adjustable and malleable. And if you want to hear the album version of the song, it's out there on the season three soundtrack. And that's actually the virgin, version of, from the later episode in the season that has the violins in it that Curtis got to conduct, which was a really amazing moment to watch him conduct in a New York orchestra adding violins to our song. And that's a pretty special moment. So uh, I hope that helps you sort of see the process. It's quick, it's intense, but it was really gratifying to sort of do something so intense and, and uh, creative, contributing to a show and contributing to its story. Because Maisel, the one thing about Maisel is that it's a show that uses music as a means of storytelling. And as people who write uh, songs for theater, that's something that we just love that they're willing to do with Maisel. Thanks again, Tom and Curtis, for this engaging, insightful, entertaining masterclass. Uh, and of course, I have a new one in my head now for the rest of the day. Uh, there was one story you told me a few days ago about uh, one of the actresses, the singers, who came to your studio and she said something uh, about uh, that she was researching your song and it kind of shows what, a, what an amazing period song you created here. Yeah, we, we were, uh, when we got into the studio the first, that very first day to record One Less Angel and Bottle of Pop, the three women who, who do the backup vocals, um, and they, they don't actually lip sync, the same women who are on screen or the, are the voices that you hear on the recording, they're great singers. Um, they, uh, the one of them, Alicia, came up to me and said, I spent all weekend trying to find this on YouTube to find the song. And I was like, you're not gonna find it on YouTube because you are creating the original song. <laughs> and it was just a really, you know, we've, we've actually gotten that a, a quite a few times since, uh, since it, it's aired because What's really interesting about Maisel, you know, it's, it's, it's always been, as Tom pointed out, these great, great needle drops. So there, is, there isn't any original music in Maisel until this year. So um, we really had to create stuff that would fit in that pocket. And, uh, and so we've gotten some comments back and forth from people being like, what is, what, you know, where are those songs? Why haven't we heard them? It's because they're, they're original. We also had the opposite happen where our family doesn't know which songs are ours. Like my dad, could you said, could you just send me a note and tell me which songs are, are yours? Because we're not sure. They all sound they sound good. And like, well, okay, that's standing us up against up against some of our idols to I think know. that our songs are as good as some of the other songs they use. Yeah, we've this we, is we've, awesome. we've been we've been misquoted that we've been credited some songs we didn't write that we've been credited for. Someone <laughs> said that we wrote Nightingale sang in Barker Square. I would love to have written that song. I did not. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're we're very happy with how how it's been received. So tell me, are you coming back for season four? Are you writing original songs for season four? Is it something you can talk about already? We you know from your lips, uh, we don't know yet because uh, they haven't written the season yet as far as we know. You know, we had such a great time and we feel lucky to have been embraced by the Maisel family because they're the A-team. I mean, everyone on that crew, the cast, everybody is the top of their game. So it was a joy to join the team for a little while and We'll see. I mean, we'd love to do more, and music is essential to Maisel, so hopefully they'll want some more. Well, fingers crossed, because I want to hear more of your music. Thanks, uh, we do too. So it seems, you know, you said you're, uh, you know, you're in uh, upstate New York right now, and usually you're in uh, New York City, and uh, Tom is in Los Angeles, so you're kind of used to working remotely in your studios. But during this stay-at-home order right now, do you feel something changed, and... Uh, and as far as uh, workflow and also, how do you keep your spirits up during this time? Uh, I'll start, you know, it's, it's interesting, um, as we sort of mentioned at the beginning, Tom and I have been, he lives on the other side of the country from me, so we're used to sort of doing this. We do video chats every day 
when we're writing. Um, but And we joke that even when we were in New York, Tom was in Brooklyn and I was in Manhattan. And sometimes we just couldn't be bothered to take the subway under the East River. So we would FaceTime even in New York City and we were only, you know, 45 minutes away from each other. But so for us, in a, in a, in a weird way, it's been business as usual, um, at least in a, in a, in a literal way, you know, obviously it's, it's very stressful what's going on to our friends and family and uh, especially what's going on with the industry. We're, we're all up, up on edge a little bit because all of our projects are canceled or delayed. Um, but I'm really, really lucky that I have Tom to work with and someone that, that can hold me accountable and, and I can show up and collaborate on a daily basis with him. We've got a lot of projects in various states of completion. And so that's, uh, we're able to sort of keep that going in this time. And um, j Tom, jump in too, but the one yeah. thing that's also been great is we've we've actually been able to uh, keep demos going too. We've been hiring um, our friends in their isolation to record tracks for us um, and, uh, you know, keeping them active as well. It's, it's keeping keeping the art flowing is what we're trying to do at this time. Yeah, and some days it's, some days it's just talking to each other and sort of talking about the practicalities of things and uh, we always try to see each other in person once a month or so in the past so it has been a little different knowing that we can't make that trip and bring people one of the things that Maisel does really well and that Amy and Dan insist upon is a sense of liveness they want takes long takes they want things to feel live they want the feeling of a collective energy and that's the hardest thing to recreate right now is that we want we want singers in a room. We want actors in a room. And that's the thing that we miss most is, is that creative energy in, in, the, in the same space. Exactly. I think that's, that's exactly right. We, you know, we're such collaborative spirits and Maisel is such a collaborative space. Uh, I mean, more than I could ever imagine. There's never, there's never a time when uh, you're not working with a, a, any number of people in that process. And I think we're trying to keep doing that as much as we can now in this time. Um, to keep that collaboration going. And that's just, you know, uh, how we work. There's, there's, you know, we, we write much better songs when we're, when we're in dialogue with people than we would ever do if we we're just sitting, mm -hmm. uh, sitting by ourselves. Well, let's hope that uh, we can all meet soon again in person and to live theater and live performance as I think it's essential for us as human beings, which at these times show that even more so that we need each other. We, we need to, we are, you know, we need community. I have one more question at the end. Which recording artist would you like to write a song for? Oh my gosh, there's so many. <laughs> just one. Oh, oh, wait a minute. One recording, oh gosh, I'm just going to make myself sound totally cheesy. Tom, who's yours? I'm putting you on the spot. If I could have one of our songs sung by anybody, um, I would really like to write a song for Ariana Grande. That'd yeah, be really yeah. fun to take, <laughs> to take like our sort of, she has a music theater background. She has a, an amazing pop voice to take our, what our skills are, which is combining kind of those worlds. Uh, I think she'd be a fun one to write for. I think that's great. That's a uh, much more exciting than any of one. I mean, oh gosh, that's a really tough question. There's so many people that I love. You've put me on the spot. Um, who would I want to write for? Um, Come on, you know, you know who you're going to say. You're going to say, say it. Okay. Just well, say okay. Barry Manilow. I would, oh, I was, <laughs> yes, yes. I want to write a song for Barry Manilow. Can I, oh, can I write a song for Barry Manilow, please? I know he writes his own songs, but he sometimes sings other songs. I would love that. If Barry Manilow wants to sing a song of mine, I'm in it. I'm in. Well, let's and, not and, Barry Manilow and Ariana Grande. <laughs> yeah. And if Johnny Mathis is listening, if he actually wants to sing one of those songs, that are, are from Maisel, give us a call because that would be pretty darn exciting. Uh, awesome. Like <laughs> thanks again, Tom and Curtis, and thanks everyone for checking out Composer Talks with White Bear PR. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel or to your favorite platform, podcast platform that is. Thank you again and see you soon. Bye. Bye.